Well, now on Radio 4, the chief rock critic of The Times, Peter Perfides, continues his look at great lost albums. This week he hears about the folk classic Bright Phoebus, which has been called the Sergeant Pepper of the folk world. It was pure 60s. <laughs> Daydream, psychedelic in some ways. It was an awareness of another world that wasn't grey. Sometimes it's a fantasy world, sometimes it's a deeply poetic world, sometimes it's an idealised world. It was quite a mysterious album in a lot of ways for me because it wasn't as immediate as the music that was around all the time, you know, the music they sang all the time in the house. I suppose you could even make a comparison with Dylan going electric at Newport Festival in the mid-60s. It did cause massive ripples, waves even, on the smooth surface of the traditional music scene in this country. The record in question is Bright Phoebus by Lal and Mike Waterson, a record that mapped out all sorts of new possibilities for the English folk song. Twelve postcards from a world where beauty and hardship are intertwined. When it appeared in 1972, Lal and Mike were known for their work alongside their sister Norma and John Harrison in the Watersons. They were folk singers in the 60s, a decade which saw an explosion of interest in traditional British music. Mike Waterson. We were brought up by Grandma a generation back where we didn't listen to the radio, we didn't have a TV, we sat round the fire and we sang. If my father and mother had lived, we'd have probably been into jazz because my dad was a great jazz fan. Grandma wasn't. Grandma was into music hall and hymns and one or two of them were folk songs, you know. For it's a lonesome, what's up here, don't you bound for Botany Bay? I was born... We used to have poetry, and we were given a poem, 64 kids, and you had to come back the next week and know it. And there was a shilling for the ones who could remember it. Well, guess what? I got the coin week after week after week. Oh, the broom, the bonny, bonny broom, the broom of golden love. By the time of their first visit to London, the Watersons had already attracted the attention of Topic Records in-house producer Bill Leader. Inside of eight months, we were professional singers, and it was not what we wanted. What did you want? We wanted to sing. <laughs> There's a subtle difference. A real difference. You're travelling hundreds of miles, and whether you felt good, bad or indifferent, you stand up on a stage and turn it on. Once I was a bonny For Lal and Mike Waterson, both of whom who had started families by the mid-60s, fame came as something of a shock. Martin Carthy had been a regular visitor to their Folk Union One club nights in Hull. They were absolutely worn out, and the final straw was doing, I think it was at Queen's University, Belfast. Started at 8 o'clock, they did a half an hour, and they introduced singer after singer after singer after singer after singer. They finally got off the stage at about 5 o'clock in the morning, and they went back to where they were sleeping, and they sat on their bed and they stared at each other and they said, we've had enough, no more. That's it. For the first time in their lives, the Watersons went their separate ways. Norma accepted an offer to become a DJ on the island of Montserrat. John Harrison moved south to study fiddle. Lal married her husband George and moved to Leeds, leaving Mike in Hull with his new guitar. Lo and behold, Lal and George came back to Hull and Lal says, What do you think of this? I've been writing these songs. And I said, Snap, what do you think of these? I've been writing these songs. And it was because we were missing singing. In this kind of period where, I guess it's kind of like a period of limbo in a way, what were your lives like at that point in time? Well, Lal was a housewife with a couple of children and I'd go to work as a painter and decorator and, and do a bit of joinery work or a bit of bricking or a bit of plastering or whatever, you know. Lal lived in the avenues in Hull. Every dinner time I went round to her house for an hour and we wrote songs. 
And then, uh, we, what do you think of this? He said, it's great, that's wonderful, he said. Just needs tidying up, she said. And you'd go back the following week and there was another wonderful tune. And she dumped the old one. Winifred Rod was born on one cold May morning in June in her grandmother's bedroom. And they waited all that day for last May to come back again, but it never came. By 1970, Martin Carthy had also fancied a change. He swapped his acoustic guitar for an electric one and went on tour with a brand new band, Steel Ice Band. I think we did Hull Art School or something and went round the next morning to visit Lau and she had all these songs. And some of them, we just had these extraordinary words. She writes in a very organic, very animal way, but her style is quite distinct from folk music. And she always had a really astonishing harmonic sense, so that when I actually sat down with her to try and find out what she was getting at harmonically, we'd spend, you know, like two hours on one song while I sort of tried something and said, how's that? And she said, it's very nice. Is that what you want? No. <laughs> you know, so try something else and gradually sort of inch your way to the end of the song. And she waited for death to come and of one, but he never came. The folk world at that time was quite an interesting place. It was just before the whole thing imploded. Things hadn't become too self-satisfied. Life was still pretty vibrant. There were a lot of clubs. What was actually happening was that the music was changing because it was now in a new setting. In the early 70s, folk could no longer be contained by the narrow definition set out by the 60s folk revival. Fairport Convention and Steel Ice Band helped bring folk rock to the commercial forefront of British music, while artists like Pentangle and Incredible String Band offered daring arrangements of traditional and self-written songs, which blew open the parameters of what might be considered a folk song. These were artists in step with the prevailing spirit of experimentation who had a sitar and weren't afraid to use it. A schism had opened up between purists and the new crop of musicians. As innovative as their approach might have seemed back in the mid-60s, the Watersons had become emblematic of the old ways. If they ever got back together, original self-written material would have been the last thing their fans expected of them. It was the time. You know, when the Beatles were off in India, I'd already ten years before read Levi's Transcendental Magic, you know. It was in the library, you read it, relaxing and yoga and stuff like that, and it was all just so much rhubarb to me. But obviously it rubs off, and you wanted an alternative to what was going on. Having left Fairport Convention in 1970, Ashley Tiger Hutchings found himself alongside Martin Carthy in Steel Ice Band. When Martin played him the songs, Ashley's reaction was immediate. I was instantly in tune with them. I found an empathy with them and, you know, I really would have fought off anyone <laughs> to play the bass on those uh, songs as I did. Martin Carthy. Ashley is a doer. And as soon as he heard him, he said, right, I'm going to get all the Fairport lads together and we're going to do this. Just one question remained. Where to record these songs? Now running his own record company, Trailer, Bill Leader, the man who had first signed the Watersons, suggested Cecil Sharp House, headquarters of the English Folk Dance and Song Society in leafy North London. The studio, such as it was, had to be built by Bill Leader. You know, mics and baffles and everything had to be carefully placed because it wasn't a recording studio. As I roved out one summer's morn 
I saw a scarecrow tied to a pole. So you're in Cecil Sharp House with these songs, and it's kind of interesting in a way because Cecil Sharp House is the absolute sort of bastion of doing things traditionally and kind of doing other people's songs in a way. And you came in with these songs that, that you and your sister had written. And that's pretty. That's pretty cool. <laughs> the part and parcel of the tradition. I mean, Scarecrow was wonderful. I would you lay me down and look me. I would you lay me down and look me if you could. Boy, you're only a band of the runs in an overall. That the wind. Way, so the crows fly away and the corn can grow tall. We were reading at the time, we just bought the full set of the early folk song journals. I think it's uh, Hugh of Lincoln, or round about there, was a thing talking about jelly dons. Those parts were lifted. <laughs> I saw twelve jolly dons dressed out. I mean, you get twelve jolly dons dressed out in the blue and the gold again. It was symbolism. And to a stake, they tied a child newborn. Lyle wrote two verses to that. And she says, where does it go now? And I hung the child on the stake. That was my verse. It's the dark, it's it's dark stuff, isn't it? it was, I knew that sacrificial stuff went on in the early days. Now you can lay me down and love me if you will. Or you're only a bang of ranks in an overall. I brought it along just because I just thought maybe it might even jog a couple of memories. In my supermarket bag, here it is, Bright Phoebus. So looking yeah. at that, we've got this picture of this kind of, it's like a pagan sun almost, isn't it? It is, um, you know, it's, it's exactly that. Yeah. You wrote the title track, Bright Phoebus. Can you remember what was happening in your life? Yeah. The lad of Wexford was called Brian, and he said, how do you write a song? And I was painting a window, a big Victorian window, and I said, I don't know, it's like, you know, the sun shone through, literally, from the clouds. And I said, it's like, today, Bright Phoebus, she shot, and he said, what do you mean? And I had to explain what Phoebus was. And I carried on with the verse. I then says, you'll have to excuse me. And uh, put my stuff down. I went round to Lala's and picked a guitar up and got the chords quick before I forgot. And then I went back to work again. You know, <laughs> docked an hour off my time. Today bright Phoebus, she smiled down on me for the very first time. On the very first time she smiled on me. Contemporary folk singer and fiddle player Eliza Carthy, daughter of Norma Watson and Martin Carthy, remembers listening to Bright Phoebus as a child. I always loved rubber band now, so it was very, very silly. I'm not quite sure about just like margarine, our famous spreading. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that. <laughs> Just like margarine, our famous spreading And our eyes will start on one this slow Obviously my favourite bit when I was a kid was the rubber band solo in the middle as well, the boingy bit. <laughs> it got you started, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, my famous rubber band career. <laughs> Ashley Hutching. To a certain extent, they felt out of their depth. They'd not worked with electric guitars and drums and so forth, and indeed many other musicians before. So they were happy to sit and listen and see how it came together. We dreamed our way through that recording, I think. We'd never seen this sort of stuff done. We were an unaccompanied group. You were flying. Come to one of the things that they did so very, very well was being able to describe absolutely everyday situations in very, very beautiful terms. And that's a real gift, and that's a pop music gift for me. 
Shot Among the Weeds is absolutely extraordinary song. I it's don't believe that part of that was because Lal had a very difficult childbirth with our Oliver. And Oliver was twins and they lost his sister. And A Child Among the Weeds is a very graphic description of, of a woman giving birth. Child among the wings Don't need no beans Just sing him a lullaby, lullaby All the long night through I was dreading Fly Bird Fly because it wasn't in my key at all and I was going to have to drink half a bottle of port and cross my legs to do that one and Bob Davenport walked in and Bob is the man who faced with a song in the wrong key just sings it it's bloody mindedness <laughs> pure and simple the day has only just begun the silver sun is shining Wake up, wake up, everyone, the day is only dazzling. Fly, bird, fly. If you'd never heard anything else on the album, when it absolutely takes off, it's almost like orthodox church music. It's like a liturgy, and to hear it in this setting is just absolutely extraordinary. It was done in one take. <laughs> no overdubs, no nothing. But I just played a harmonic and I thought, oh, that sounds nice, and played another harmonic and then just played a few more. Sounds like an absolute right. moment. And the hair stood on end and just played, please don't screw it up. Sing him lullaby, lullaby. Sing for the love of weeping and banning. And sing for the love This is the time when Norma and I met up and decided to get married. But it was during the week we were making Bright Phoebus album that all that stuff happened. But I mean, it was a long time coming. Why was it a long time coming? Because we met in 1961, she was married and I wasn't. So uh, next time we met in 63, she wasn't married and I was. <laughs> then she went away to Montserrat for four years. Then Bright Phoebus got made and she and I finally talked to each other properly in a manner of speaking and decided at the end of that week we'd get married. I think Never the Same is my absolute favourite, and Red Wine Promises as well, because there's a romantic story attached to Red Wine Promises about my mum and dad and that kind of thing. It's just me on guitar and Norma singing, isn't it? It's no Richard. I don't know why nothing was added, but it was decided that that was it. She went out with our George, her husband, uh, onto Beverly Road in Hull, had a bottle of red wine, came back through Pearson's Park, pouring down with rain, so she leapt these metal hoop fence things, you know. Didn't make it, splat on her back, and she wrote, fell in the street, the street in a drunken heap. There's bright water all around me. And the cheap red wine in my drunken brain has left. A burning flame in my belly As the recording of Bright Phoebus drew to a close, spirits ran high. Lala Mike Watson began to get a sense of the enormity of what their songs had achieved. I don't have the words to describe it. It was just sheer, unimaginable joy. Something that you've written just suddenly multiplied by ten. I think there's no doubt that we realised when it was all finished that it was a great album. And then we just kind of sat back and waited. Uh, waited for what, exactly? <laughs> waited for what? Um, I think we sat back and waited for a spectacularly successful embracing of the album. We all knew that we'd done something extraordinary and it did not get good reviews. Johnny can play sitting in a shower of rain So 
sunny, sunny days of all Turned over to filthy weather Dave Bulmer was a young accordion player on the folk circuit. Supplementing his income by selling records for Bill Leader at his shows, he stumbled on a career as a record distributor. In 1972, Dave was charged with the job of selling Bright Phoebus to record shops. The press 2,000 copies, but a thousand of them were faulty. And Bill told me that they couldn't do anything with these records, so they basically ended up with a thousand copies. And it wasn't one of the better sellers, if I remember rightly. No, <laughs> didn't go well at all, no. The record basically became a catalogue item very quickly. You've got to understand that this was missing traditional music. A lot of people looked down their nose at us for doing that. So it must have been a dreadful surprise, in a way, when it came out and some negative reviews started appearing in the press, which seemed not to understand what you were trying to do. It, it, does, it doesn't matter. But it did. I, I understand that you actually had people going up to you at shows and saying, well, what did you make that record for, you know? Well, yeah, you know. That must have been devastating, though. You do what you do. Who were you making the record for? It seems to me that the record sort of mapped out possibilities, for English music in particular, that never quite materialised as fully as we m might expect. Yes, I think you're looking at an album that showed ways that English music could go from there. It was to get worse for Bright Phoebus. Ten years later, in 1982, interest in folk music had dipped to an all-time low. Bill Leader, unable to pay his debts, sold on all the titles on his trailer label, including Bright Phoebus. After changing hands again, Trailer's back catalogue was bought by the musician who'd had the task of selling it to record shops in the first place, Dave Bulmer. I know when we took the thing over, there was somewhere in the region of 400 vinyl copies and we've still got hundreds left. There was very little interest compared to other things we were doing. Things like the Martin Burns album that Bill did, which is one of the best fiddle albums I'd ever heard as a kid. So we put that out straight away. Money's limited, it's not an unlimited situation. You gotta put it where you believe you can afford to put your money. As CDs gradually usurped vinyl in the affections of music fans, Bright Phoebus remained conspicuous by its continued absence from record shops. Inevitably, its status assumed mythical proportions, both to those who heard it, but perhaps more so for those who hadn't. For Martin Carthy and others, it was a profound source of exasperation. I am bewildered at his reluctance to put this stuff out. Bright Phoebus is a shining, shining piece of work. It's an album that he's talked about a lot these days. I mean, it should surely be a fairly straightforward thing, shouldn't it? I mean, it would be in everyone's interest, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> That's the short answer. I can't speak for Dave Bulmer. I have not the slightest idea why he will not do anything f or do much about putting that album out. Sleeping in my bed. If I remember rightly, with Barry Fevers, we had a problem over contracts which we needed copies of those copies were found the stuff was checked up with the prs to make sure everything was registered correctly and it wasn't you'd think it would be a very simple thing to do but actually some of these organizations can take years to sort the simplest of things out when we got that cleared up we put it out on cd and that was it as far as i was concerned mike waterson he reprinted it and brought it out with no publicity no push i did a couple of interviews and it fizzed again didn't do anything that must feel really frustrating to sort of know that it's not generally widely available anybody that wants a copy can get a copy of course you can get it anybody can get it it sells and trickles away but that's about as far as you could say it goes and in most folk records that's what actually happens they don't actually earn back the cost of putting them out without going into complications he copied the lp i know he didn't have the tapes the masters who has the masters? My lips are sealed. <laughs> oh, I know I had the master tapes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that one, the tapes are there. The original contract for Bright Phoebus, as signed by all the musicians, said that if sales of the record fail to exceed 2,000, thus effectively failing to cover the cost of production, the artist would be due no royalties. I sent him a copy. I copied everything we had on paper to him. Bill was very good. He had everything documented. Basically, they don't earn any royalties off it because in the contract there's no royalties. They signed it. 
He turned round to me not so long back and said, I'm refusing to pay you any royalties whatsoever. I don't like you. That's absolute rubbish. Yeah. Never said that. That's absolute garbage. If Mike said that, I'm really surprised. I mean, we used to do gigs at his club back in the 70s over in the rugby and home. I know him. Father says kill them, preacher says God's will be done, mother says be still then, roses in the meadow, and the sheep are on the hill still, and the beds are on the willow. It's nine years, isn't it, since Lyle died, is that right? Yeah. She had a chest infection and then decided to go for a chest x-ray and it was too late. And Lal never looked after herself. I mean, the hero in my thing is our George, her husband, who looked after her, who let her spend all day painting, who let her write poems and songs, you know, who cleaned the house and cooked the meals after he'd been to work. If Lal was here now and she could sort of see us making a fuss about this record, what, what do you think she'd say? That it's all gone. Songwriting's therapeutic, and as much as once you've written it, it's gone. And you're better. But it isn't all gone. As the territorial battles of the old folk scene gradually shrink in the rearview mirror of time, Bright Phoebus's place in the pantheon of folk seems a little greater with every passing year. How ironic that these songs were once so disparaged for the mere fact that they were written by the people who sang them. The mark of their greatness is that they don't sound like they were ever written. They sound like they were always out there, awaiting excavation from the North Yorkshire Moors where Lal spent many of her happiest years. I would happily play Bright Phoebus to anyone who needs to learn a little bit more about the history of pop music in this country. I mean, I have a son who's 15 now, and this is one of the albums he needs to hear. Are these folk songs? What are they? Um, they're art songs, aren't they? I don't know. <laughs> if you'd asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have said, no, they're pop songs. Now I would probably say that they're folk songs. They're not traditional songs. Or if you got me drunk, I might say pop songs. <laughs> It's very, very strange. You start writing a song and you get your first verse and then the song takes over and it leads you not where you want to be. Most of the songs in Bright Phoebus was where we wanted to be, in that little daydream world. She was a bloody fool because she lived on coffee and toast and cigarettes. But what she managed to do, as far as I was concerned in her lifetime, was magnificent. Day bright Phoebus, she smiled down on me for the very first time. For the very first time, she smiled, she smiled, she smiled on me. Bright Phoebus was this week's Lost Album. The programme was presented by The Times Chief Rock Critic Peter Perfides and produced by Laura Parfit. It was a unique production for BBC Radio 4.